So um, first of all, I'd want to welcome everybody to the this PI meeting. It's, it's really it's one of my favorite events, but we haven't had it in in, in several years now. So it's it's starting to get very um, tiresome, along with so many other things about uh, about COVID. Um, so welcome all, and I'm looking forward to um, I'm looking forward to actually um, learning a, a bunch about the work that many of our PIs are doing. Um, and again, I just wish we were doing this in person. So my first task and, and uh, in, an enjoyable one is to introduce you all to the Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, who's a passionate defender of students and, and the need for education um, across the lifespan and across the country. So uh, uh, Secretary Cardona has made some welcoming remarks, which we'll turn to right now. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Your efforts have set up IES for ongoing impact, especially during this milestone year. Congratulations to all staff and grantees on 20 years of research to help improve academic outcomes for learners across the nation. And thank you to the researchers, the fellows, and the IES staff participating in this meeting. We're in a critical moment in education, one that demands reflection on where we are and where we need to go. Our North Star must be that every student everywhere has access to a world-class education that challenges and inspires them. But it's gonna take continued determination and hard work to get there. This is especially true given the historical inequities that our most underserved students have faced and the pandemic's effects on educational opportunity and outcomes. This pandemic has also presented the education research community with unprecedented challenges. And these challenges are coming at a time when the need for this research is greatest. Even and especially when it's difficult, thank you for your commitment to doing the work that keeps our teachers teaching, our students learning, and our nation moving forward. America's students need you and your best efforts to identify, measure, and address disparities where they exist in education so that we can target support and resources where they're needed most. Because after all, difficult doesn't mean impossible. It can't mean impossible. We owe it to our students to address our toughest challenges. Our students have suffered enough amid the pandemic. We need to devise solutions that eliminate the widening gaps in education. We need to understand which interventions are most helpful in addressing our students' academic, mental health, and social emotional needs. We need to identify the areas where our educator shortages are the greatest, and then use that knowledge to create solutions so that every child has access to effective, well-trained, and well-supported teachers. Your work has already made a difference for our students during the pandemic, including the creation of an evidence-based generator that helps teachers and schools identify which interventions work best to address their students' needs. You've provided free resources to educators too, not only to improve academic outcomes, but also to support the complex social, behavioral, and mental health needs of students. These efforts have been particularly impactful for our historically underserved students, including rural students, students from low-income backgrounds, students with disabilities, and students of color. And with the American Rescue Plan funds, you're meeting the needs of our diverse learners. From supporting transitions back to school for in-person learning, to building the evidence base of promising instructional practices in elementary school math, your work is helping to mitigate the effects of school closures and to accelerate students' learning. This is an important goal we all share, finding evidence-based solutions for both the most persistent and the newest challenges in education, especially for learners who have not been served well by our systems. As we move forward, let's make good on our promise to help fulfill the limitless potential of our students. Let's continue to generate evidence of what works to reimagine teaching and learning. Together, we will make education truly and finally the great equalizer we all know it can be. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the meeting. As I noted, a, a passionate defender and advocate 
for the rights and, and learning of, of students. So um, I had to make some choices. I have uh, 25 minutes or so uh, to, to share with you. So I've decided to start with a, um, a, an update on IS's standards for excellence in education research, the SEER principles. And the reason I've written about this in blogs, I hope some of you read, read them. Um, th this is the fund, this, this providing the foundation, the basis for the kind of work that we need to do for good science. So I'm, I'm gonna uh, just bring some updates uh, on this topic. Hold on a second, another glitch here. Okay, so what am I gonna do? Um, I'm gonna do an overview of SEER. Most of you already know it, so that'll be very quick. Um, I wanna talk about what was new for SEER in 2021. And finally, I'm going to uh, outline some changes, both SEER and non-SEER um, uh, innovations that you should be on the lookout for in 2022. So again, just as a reminder, SEER, uh, we've developed SEER to uh, increase rigorous education that is transparent, actionable, and focused on consequential outcomes that have the potential to improve student achievement. So at the current time, there are eight SEER principles, pre-register studies, make findings, methods, and data open, identify intervention components, document treatment uh, implementation and contrast, analyze interventions cost, use high quality outcome measures, facilitate generalization of study findings and support scaling of promising interventions. So I want to also note that we are working on a ninth principle, a ninth, a ninth seer principle that will focus on equity. And we, it will read something like, consider equity of social resources and outcomes. So that is a short statement, like the rest of the SEER standards has many implications and many dimensions to it. So we are working on the exact language, um, but again, consider equity of societal resources and outcomes is what we're working on at the current time. And we're working again on the exact language, but more importantly, we are going to continue working on how to turn this principle into actual standards. So that, as you know, is one of the goals that we have across all the other SEER standards. Um, and what we're trying to do with this ninth one is to turn it into actual standards that we could use to judge research. Um, needless to say, this is in the um, formative stages. So we are actually uh, very anxious to hear from the field about that, the, the, the wording and, and some of the ways in which we can implement and, and bring this ninth SEER principle to, um, to, to life. So let me uh, review some of the uh, big changes that we did in, uh, for SEER in 2021. And basically you'll see the common theme in the four or five things that I'm going to talk about is we're trying to help the field with concrete products that push SEER forward. So here are some examples. So with regard to making findings, methods, and data open, we developed a sharing study guide, a guide, to, uh, a guide for education researchers that focuses on steps researchers can make uh, can take to make their data available consistent with IES public access policies. This guide will be published um, in the next few months in 2022. With regard to generalization of study findings. So we've developed enhancing the generalizability of study findings in education. Again, this will be out early in 2022 and outlines the steps PIs can take to increase the likelihood that findings from impact studies generalized to the, the populations of students they hope to serve. A concrete guide will be published later this year. Support of scaling uh, promising interventions. So this of course is one of the biggest uh, issues that we've been facing and we've been facing this for a long time without a lot of success. And that is um, if we find interventions that work, we need to scale them up to get them into the hands of as many students and as many schools and many teachers as possible. So we supported SRI International in the development of a, a guide from research to market, development of a transition process to integrate sustainable scaling methodologies into education innovation, research design and development. I probably, I probably just should have stopped with the first from research to market, because the subtitle's really long. But anyway, this report, which is available now, advances a framework for scaling innovations, and includes a series of questions that PIs should ask prior to the development of an intervention to increase the likelihood of its adoption by indicators. Um, we're, also, uh, we're also developing the BASI framework for interpreting findings from impact evaluations. 
which is, again, a practice guide, and that'll be published again this year. Um, and it, it's really what we're trying to do in this is to um, augment traditional approaches to reporting impact analysis with a whole range of different techniques and more user-friendly um, uh, measures um, that will help our studies be more easily understood and more scientifically accurate. Um, we're also, this is, uh, when, we, uh, when we laid out the, one of the SEER principles to identify components, we knew that this was going to be a heavy lift, right? So the idea here is to find the, um, the idea here is to find the, the components that really work and then to identify them in such a way that we could do, for example, cost analysis. So we hired Mathematica to develop an initial framework for intervention components and approach to developing uh, topically um, focused nomenclatures that identify components typical of interventions in two fields, foundational literacy and post-secondary development math education. So we're testing these nomenclatures um, and, and coding components to learn more about their accuracy and ease of use. This is obviously going to have a um, an effect on what we do with the What Works Clearinghouse, and we're testing analytic approaches uh, that associate components and impact estimates with the goal of identifying the core components and then to be able to do cost analysis. Public facing materials on this effort will be available later this summer. Um, in 2020, we also supported cost analysis and practice, the CAP project at Teachers College. And this is of course, to provide technical assistance to improve cost analysis, one of the core uh, um, SEER principles. And in 2020, we also supported Brown University Ed Instruments Project to refine and enhance its library of six domains, including uh, middle school mathematics, SEL, civics, and school climate. And the goal here is to increase the use of high quality uh, measures. So let me just highlight three sessions that are, um, that are available, that are totally SEER focused. So issues and resource and planning for uh, implementing a cost analysis is uh, will feature experts from the CAP project. And that's Wednesday at one, taking evidence-based practices to scale, which is the SRI project. That's Wednesday at 2.30 and putting the SEER principles into practice. And that's going to cover the three guides that I mentioned, um, the three research guides. And that's at Thursday at 11.30. So what to look forward in 2022. So we, we are committed to making SEER a, a living part of the research and education sciences. So we are continuing to support the development of the SEER principles and turning them into standards. And we are going to support our grantees and contractors uh, to, to use SEER principles, but we're going to increase the, um, the accountability of the work that we pay for um, and making sure that uh, holding them accountable for the SEER, for, uh, for, for meeting SEER principles. So just one quick example, uh, as noted, making findings, methods, and data open in our research awards is part of, the, of one of the SEER principles. And uh, we're going to start enforcing the requirements uh, for sharing results and the data behind those results. And, and one of these things, we have to get up to 100% um, um, adherence to the to the requirement that um, research reports be published in ERIC. We're up to about 45%, uh, but we need to get up to 100% on that. So we're also going to increase, we're also going to increase uh, requirements for, uh, for describing planned and actual uh, samples. So here are some other activities that, that we should be looking forward to in, 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 this, in this year. So here, there's a rule of thumb that I learned from one of my good friends and who does artificial intelligence work. He said that the current work is described by an 80-20 distribution of time. 80% of the time and the work is spent on finding data and only 20% of the time is doing the work. So clearly we need to think about how to flip that around so that people could spend 20% of the time finding the data that they need and 80% of the time doing their work. And a related issue to that um, has to do with the need that we, that we have in education science research to use much larger samples than we typically have. So somewhere, a, a, a minuscule percentage of published reports 
um, in education sciences use uh, data, uh, samples of more than a thousand. And we need to figure out how to, how to increase the number of large N studies that we support. So we, we're thinking about what infrastructure plays IES could uh, engage in. So you know that we've been supporting platforms and we, uh, the X Prize is moving along, and we did support platform, uh, a network of, of platform providers. E they, they all have 100,000 or more users. And the goal is to work on these networks as, a, as an infrastructure that will enable people to do certain kinds of research on larger samples faster and to replicate more easily. So we look at platforms as an infrastructure play by IES that's, that, that's pretty far along, and we're just gonna continue uh, supporting it. So we've also been struggling with how to create a large data library that could be, uh, that could be used to facilitate machine learning and AI. So we need to train AI models. We need large data sets. So the question is, how could IES be involved in that process? How could we help facilitate the collection of large data sets that are uh, locked down with regard to privacy protection and that are ethical? And by this, I mean too many of our data sets that we are training AI work on is uh, racially biased, quite frankly. Um, we, need to, we need to make sure that any large data sets that we put together for machine learning and for AI is ethical and, 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 um, and, and, um, and available through privacy, but privacy protected. So the data libraries we're envisioning is maybe in five different topic areas, the collect large data sets that could be um, used for machine learning and for training models. Uh, this is an idea that we're just starting to kick around, but ideally we'll be able to do an RFA later this, um, later this year that will uh, encourage these kinds of, the, again, the creation of large data sets that are, um, that are ethical and are, um, are privacy protected. So that, that may seem like a, a, a niche product. Uh, you know, a lot of people just don't do uh, that kind of work. But here's another one that we've been talking about and uh, much more core to the kind of work that we traditionally support. And this is um, whether or not we could facilitate the matching between schools, school districts, and, uh, and researchers. So we know we hear this all the time and, and it's a legitimate complaint that it's so hard to recruit schools it's so hard to recruit school districts and all our work, not all of it, but most of our work uh, requires good uh, relationships with schools and identifying schools, classes, school districts that are willing to work with us. So, so here's the interesting question. Can we, uh, can we create, imagine a facility, a matching facility that on one hand collects information from schools and school districts, this is the kind of work that we need done. These are the interventions that we're interested in testing. These are the come up forthcoming decisions that we need help on. And on the other hand, we would have researchers that identified their skills, their interests and, um, um, and availability. So we know, for example, that um, when students graduate from medical school, there's a, a, a very sophisticated algorithm that assigns students, uh, uh, doctors, to uh, internships and, and ultimate residencies. Um, and, and this is Shapley and Roth did this in, I think, 1982 or 84. They won a Nobel Prize for this algorithm. This is how DC in, in, in Washington, DC, we match students with, with, uh, with schools through the same, the exact same algorithm. So I don't think it's the algorithm that is the problem. I think it's the question of, of getting a system set up where schools can, in fact, schools and school districts have an incentive to, um, to, to participate and also um, matching with, with, uh, with researchers. So part of the problem is that in, we have to build a lot of trust in that system, right? Because we know that trust, in, trust between researchers and schools and school makers, uh, school decision makers are, is fundamental to all our work, and we have to figure out how to build that in, um, in into any kind of matching facility. So, so this is like, we're struggling with this. And any ideas, are, again, would be much welcome, but we know this is a pretty serious uh, need across um, IES research. 
So I just want to end with three more things that are, are, are interest. So we will we are planning to run the transformative RFA again. Um, so keep your eye out for that. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on in various places on the Hill uh, to create a fifth center in IES that would be focused on transformative uh, research. Uh, it's the National Center for Advanced Design and Education, um, something like that, NCADE. Um, and that's getting some serious attention on the Hill. And related to that is also some, some efforts to reinvigorate the, um, the state longitudinal data system, SLDS, um, so that we would, again, a, a giant infrastructure project. Um, we need to figure out how to renovate the, those investments and those systems, and again, make sure that we can increase access to them by our researchers. And the last thing I just wanna note is that in um, starting in early um, February, the first of the three national sci uh, set, uh, academies studies that we commissioned will be released. Um, somewhere I expect around the 8th of February, the, the or maybe later than that, but mid, let's say mid-February, the NAEP report, the NASM NAEP report will be out. A, a couple of weeks after that, the NASM um, research report may be out. And then in early March, the NASM NCS report will be out. So we will have those, we will have all, all that to look forward to. Um, and again, thank you for your great work and thank you for your support of IES.